started. Um, hi everyone and welcome to our second ever Community Conversations. It's already been a couple of months since our first Community Conversation on the impact of COVID-19 on HIV testing. During that first webinar, we learned that although there have been significant challenges for organisations dealing with COVID-19, there have also been many creative ideas and solutions that can help make sure our communities can still access these vital services. We received some outstanding feedback from our first webinar and we'd like to thank everyone who joined and those who are joining us today. In today's webinar, we're covering one of the most compelling topics from last time. We received several questions about drive up, drive through and curbside HIV testing. We'll be speaking to two HIV testers who have implemented drive up and drive through programs to find out their experiences, how it worked and what they learned. We're going to be using the terms drive up, drive through uh, and curbside a little bit interchangeably just um, because everyone's program is different. Um, so now I'll just go through and introduce the panelists. Um, so let's get started. I'm delighted to introduce our panel today. We have Ishmael, Joey and Regina. So just to start with, I would love to hear a little bit about yourselves, your organisations and the communities that you serve. Um, so maybe Ishmael, you could get us started. Sure. Good morning or hello, everybody. I uh, just wanted to introduce myself, Ishmael Salamanca. Everybody calls me Ish. I am the Director of Health Services for the LGBTQ Center of Long Beach. Um, I've been with the organization for 12 years. We've been in existence since about 1980, and we got our storefront that I'm actually in right now in 1986. And we pretty much started with the, the need to be able to help folks that were impacted by the 1980s AIDS epidemic that was happening here in Long Beach. Um, so we've only been around 40 some years, um, but when it started, people were, we're dying of, of AIDS complications. And in terms of a city, we're a small town, we're about 500,000 people. And the LGBTQ community pretty much is in one small area here in Long Beach. So a group of people got together and made this um, space. It was mostly support groups in basements, local people's homes. And eventually that became its own little community within the city. And in 19, I wanna say 1981, a couple people died from HIV and AIDS and left their inheritance to the organization back then when it was called One in Long Beach. So they were a, a community and they made One Community Center and we were able to buy this building. So since 1986, we've been in this, this spot and we've been updating as the time goes on. So now since 2009, we've been doing HIV testing on a rapid um, scale and in 2014 started doing STI testing and in 2017 started doing um, transgender health, which is focused on STI, HIV testing, and essential needs around hormone replacement therapy and gender reassignment surgeries. So we've been growing exponentially since um, we really got to know our community and, and get that funding coming in. So lately, our support has definitely been refocused. Um, we're going to talk about COVID and how that impacted us, where we've actually become an essential business, not just for testing services, but everything else. Thanks. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, and Joey. Hey everyone, I am Joey Olson. Um, I've been working in uh, this particular role for about seven years now, um, although I've been working in the, the field of HIV for about 10 years. Um, it's primarily been at uh, the agency that I currently work at, uh, Crescent Care in New Orleans. We're an aid service organization uh, that turned federally qualified health center back in 2013, I believe it was. Um, but we also got our start in the early 80s as a community response to the, the early AIDS epidemic. Um, and we've kind of evolved it and grown um, uh, to the needs of the community, um, especially in recent years with this move to become a federally qualified health center. Um, we, at this point, see everyone. We kind of focus still on like service industry, LGBT folks. Um, uh, I work in the prevention department, which specifically works with like many different grants uh to to reach populations um that uh you know bear a higher burden of uh, hiv specifically but also other health outcomes um so we do testing in normal times kind of uh in lots of different spaces um i'm in new orleans uh if i didn't say that already uh so we do testing at like some of the the bars in the french quarter um, we partner with different walgreens and pharmacies and churches and community health fair events um, we test as part of like routine screening during normal appointments. 
Um, we have walk-in testing available. Um, lots, lots and lots and lots going on. Um, a couple of things have changed since COVID started, and I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit. Um, but that's kind of the, the historical look at the position and, and where we are starting from. That's great. Thank you so much, Ishmael and Joey. Um, and now on to Regina. Yes, yeah, so um, I am based in California. So I'm originally from the Bay Area. Currently, I live in Southern California and um, I'm the business development partner for the Western US. Um, earlier this year, I became the, the partner to handle the Midwest US. And um, I also help with Canada. So there's a lot um, happening in Canada. Um, right now we're getting approval for peer testing. Um, actually, we did get approval for peer testing, but we're getting an approval for self-testing. So there's a lot happening there and uh, we're hoping that we can bring that over also to the US because as you know, there's a growing need for, for self-testing. So um, I am here to help bring all that to reality. Great. Um, so we'll just move on now to our first question. Thank you all so much. You're all clearly extremely busy people. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, so our first question is, how has your organization been impacted by COVID-19? Um, which services were affected and how are things now that we're several months into the pandemic? Sorry. Let's start with uh, Joey. Sure. Um, so I think, uh, like many places, the the city here, New Orleans, was a little slow to shut down things at first. But our clinic was actually pretty ahead of the curve. Our um, chief medical officer uh, was ready to to help us get things shut down, working from home as much as possible across the agency. Um, so we actually did that before the city issued that order. Um, so that gave us a couple extra days, maybe like a week, um, to kind of make a plan for what, what this could look like uh, by the time the city shut things down. Um, at that point, most people were already working from home. We had a plan in place to uh, continue to see people for like um, kind of what we've been calling essential labs. Um, if they had to come in for something that was like an urgent uh, medical reason or otherwise deemed essential they could still come in um but the we did the whole like setup for temperature screening or uh, uh screening for uh, symptoms and anything to be able to allow, be allowed into the building the whole wearing the mask thing um hand sanitizer everywhere everything was wiped down multiple times a day that kind of thing um but along with that we also became a covid testing site um so we've been doing uh right from the beginning um COVID testing down in our garage. So we have a whole tent set up, um, outdoor waiting room, um, you know, under the under the shelter of the garage um, to do COVID screening um, that's walk-in based. Um, they have expanded it. We were testing about 40 to 50 people a day, and we're currently up to about 200 people a day that are coming in for, for COVID screenings. So that's kind of the primary thing that's happening on campus right now. Um, everything else has moved um, as much as can be to like telehealth um, for like the, the counseling and behavioral health, telehealth, um, all that kind of stuff. And we'll get into a little bit, I guess, what prevention is doing and what I'm doing for testing in, in a little bit. But we've kind of uh, fully adapted um, and yeah, that's what it looks like now. That's awesome. Um, and is that similar for you, Ishmael? <laughs> um, so very similar we not very similar but we were a little behind the curve on kind of catching up our city closed really quickly so on march 13th we got like the heads up that we were going to be closing and then by march 17th we were all out of the building um so we're not an fqhc we are a, a non-profit lgbt community center which has in within it um the hiv sti testing program so we also house mental health legal services dv services youth in our older adults program so for us, it wasn't as a simple process of what can stay open, what can't, because everyone who accessed the building was going to be in contact with each other. And we're a small organization, uh, 23 staff at the moment. So for us, it was more or less just shut down and we can plan afterwards. So uh, the city of Long Beach really kind of jumped on 
sending text messages, alerts, and everyone was out of any place working. So it was a, a big, a big shock, not just for people who are working in the field, but our community. They needed to know uh, where they can get their mental health. Um, if they were currently working on a DV crisis with legal, like what was that going to mean? Uh, we do uh, name and gender marker changes um, with our transgender health program. So now people who are waiting for that um, letter or in face-to-face -face court date, like it became, what do we do with the center? So there was a lot of shifting in priorities where sexual health really kind of took a back seat to a lot of the bigger things that we were working on, like the DV and legal and our senior program. So in about two months, we were able to kind of put together a plan with the Long Beach Health Department to be able to figure out how do we open up again in a safe way where we weren't exposing people that um, had already compromised immune systems. So my team is a team of seven, and most of them are from the community that we serve. So there's some of them on my team who um, have compromised immune systems or are older adults or um, have parents who were uh, living with them. So there was like this whole realization that we're all pretty much from the community that was at most risk of getting COVID-19. But as of May 26, we started doing testing on a drive up with uh, the blessing from the director here for um, public health and our medical director over at Long Beach Memorial to have everything kind of lined up with how we would screen folks, how we would do testing, what supplies we would need to kind of keep the staff safe. So it was a huge culture shock for us to be able to go from being a, a truly holistic place where we everyone was in one space doing everything to now being completely physically distanced and isolated. So huge culture shock for us. But now we're we're kind of back in the groove of things to hopefully be getting more connected with all of the other services that we we have here at the center. That's great. Ishmael, I have a question. How have your clients adjusted to the drive-through testing? Um, are they um, liking it? Um, do they feel that they're getting the services that they're, they're used to getting? Um, what is the feedback? So, so far the feedback has been whatever we can get, I love. So there's a lot of this gratitude of just like, I'm so happy, grateful that this is available. So we are um, I want to say one of the only LGBT specific organizations in Long Beach. We have a bunch of organizations that are LGBT affirming and friendly and open to working with our community, but we tend to be the ones where people want to go to when they talk about their sexual health. Um, so far, it's been helpful because we do have telehealth, so we use our phones with uh, our Zoom meetings. So similar to what we're doing right now, this is how now the sexual health uh, counseling sessions are happening. This is how disclosure is happening. So they feel very grateful that that's available but you can tell that there's a little bit of hesitancy sometimes to drive up and kind of get tested in your car when two parking spots over there's another person also getting tested and there's people walking down the street so it's just a a, a huge culture shock that we're getting used to the new way of doing it but they feel very um grateful to be able to have it and we also offer the walk-up version because we realize that not everyone's going to have the technology and also the uh, finances to be able to have a vehicle. So the drive up option tends to be also something that people like to do, especially here in Long Beach being such a small town, they can just walk up to the tent. And um, I, I shared some pictures earlier with Lauren about, it's kind of like a fish tank. We're inside this rubber fish tank and people come over and see us. So they, they can still connect with us with this giant plastic shield in between us. So it's, it's been received well, I think they want more. So we're definitely asking for some patients to, to get us used to this so far. So they want longer hours, uh, faster results. And so I'm not sure how they can get faster results in, in a minute, but <laughs> they are asking for more. <laughs> awesome. That's really great to hear. Awesome. Sure, thanks for the question. And we have photos from both programs coming up at the end as well, the photos that you mentioned, Ishmael. So I'm looking forward to sharing those, um, seeing the fish tank, how it is in real life. <laughs> okay, so this leads really naturally into our next question, which is about kind of the decision to do drive up testing. During our last webinar, we had a lot of people contact us about drive through testing, curbside testing, um, as some people call it, um, and making the decision to actually start doing it and where to begin. Um, so maybe you could take us through the testing process and the key considerations. Um, did you want to start us off, Ishmael, since you were already talking about the drive-through? Sure. So um, similar to the community conversation you had earlier, 
people were using the the COVID drive up testing as a model that we were kind of looking at. Like, is that something that we can now incorporate into other things? So we definitely took that as our starting point here in Long Beach. We have a maybe six or seven drive up COVID sites here or COVID testing sites here in Long Beach. So um, we kind of took that and connected with the medical director there at the Long Beach Health Department. And the nice thing about Long Beach is it's a very small town. So I could literally pick up the phone and call like the head of the health department here, which I don't think most people can do um, and just pick her brain. Kelly Colopy was amazing. And Dr. Davis was phenomenal to be like, yeah, here you go. Or let me edit your protocol. So that was very, very helpful. Um, but ideally, the, the purpose of this was we can't have people in the building. Uh, we weren't set up as a medical clinic. We're not an FQHC. So how do we make this safe for everybody? So that's when we realized we have this parking lot. So similar to Joey having access to a parking lot in the back of the building was one of those assets that we were very fortunate to have. So we're like, how do we use that? So the drive up, the way it works here is that we have designated parking spots with signage for your appointment. So when you schedule your appointment, not only do you have a time, but you have a parking spot designated. So that way you go to your parking spot, you do what you need to do. Um, and we have a digital database called Penelope uh, made by Athena, which we were literally just months before the COVID um, pandemic happened, implementing that into our uh, program to be able to make it easier, keep things in one place. But now it became a quick response to COVID. So once you get to your parking spot, we can digitally send you your forms. So you have your consent forms, your screener forms, and they fill it out on their, on their phones and it sends back the confirmation to whoever the testers are that day. And from there, it becomes a phone call or a telehealth call where we ask those questions that typically every HIV tester already asks. Like, what brings you in for testing? What are your risks? What are your questions? And this is one of the things when I was talking to Regina, moving from the 20 minute test to the minute test has always been my hesitancy because I'm losing those 19 minutes to talk about other things. Being a holistic uh, center, we talk about TV, we talk about mental health, we talk about social services. So now we're able to do that in this similar format where we're asking those basic questions, being able to see folks, they can see our faces, um, to answer those questions and kind of quash those calms that they may have. So from there, once any questions are answered, once we get the screener completed and we're able to kind of develop that quick rapport, um, the staff can go out to the person's vehicle. We have these little rolly carts with all of the stuff we need. So like the sharps containers and the trash cans and the, uh, you name it, it's all on their hand sanitizer. And they'll go to their windows, uh, to their cars, and they just lower their window enough for their hand to go out. So I always tell them, kind of like a tea, tea, teapot, you can put your hand out this way, or you can be a princess and stick your finger out that way, whichever works for you. And that's what makes it fun. We're able to just like, it's not scary to get tested in your car. We add some little flair to it. And that little amount of finger that comes out is all you need to be able to get that sample of blood. And it's become definitely a, a change of habit where you're not in this sterile, kind of like programmatic way, you kind of have to think on your toes to see what works best for, for people. But we, what we determined is that window also acts as a, as a protection between folks. Um, and everyone's encouraged to wear face masks, um, but we can't always guarantee that half the time. So that is just this added protection. And what we were able to do is use how INSTE works to our benefit. So you don't necessarily need to have the entire set for the testing kit in front of you, like you need the other testing kits. For this one, you can just fill out that one vial, the, the red tube, and you put the sample in there, you take care of your patient, and you let them know, we'll be back in. I'll call you in about five minutes. I'm gonna run this inside and I'll have your results ready. So that's when the team goes back inside, which is maybe like, I don't know, like a minute walk to go into the lab and they're able to process everything inside now a controlled lab. So we don't have to worry about temperatures outside or any kind of lighting issues outside. And it just makes the process easier. Um, and it also provides that buffer, which is something I always told Regina is how do we prepare for a positive test result? So far, we haven't gotten uh, any positive test results in, in a couple months that we've been doing this, but it gives staff that time to kind of step away and be able to be prepared in case uh, they have to give an HIV positive test result. Um, and from there, they just give results over the phone or via video chat and anything else that they may need, they'll walk over with uh, pamphlets on prep or pamphlets on programs that we're doing. Um, so that's pretty much the, the thing in a nutshell. In terms of the other alternatives, so in doing this, we realize that we have to take into consideration folks that don't have cars. So that's where like the, the fish tank kind of comes in where people can walk up to this three-walled pop-up tent with uh, clear plastic walls 
that has a cutout in uh, about arm's length and people just walk up uh, after they do the whole um, screener at another pop-up tent. They just walk up, give us a sample, go back to that pop-up tent and the conversations just go um, either over the phone or, or video chat. Um, so we've had a couple of people who don't have phones either. So we're able to kind of have a very quiet conversation outside or uh, just create a space where we can go talk with them on the side if they don't have access to a phone. And mostly those are people that, were, that are experiencing homelessness or housing insecurity who don't have access to any other resources and just walk up and see us um, doing the test. So that's pretty much it. It's been going very, very well so far. Uh, we're about to increase hours now that we're getting the hang of it. So nice to hear. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for INSTI. It's been a godsend, I think. That's great. Yeah, that's so great to hear. And certainly not like something, you know, we're not uh, prompting anything like that. We just, you know, so appreciate it and so happy that it's um, that able to make this difference. Um, it's just so good to hear for us since, yeah. you know, this is our day to day working with this product. Um, so Joey, I'd love to hear about your programs as well. Um, what if, what, how did you decide to get started? And um, again, I'd love to hear the, the walkthrough of the testing process for, you, for your organization. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'll start by saying uh, pre-COVID, we had a pretty robust linkage to care system. Um, and so for everything that I'll be talking about, we've continued to be able to implement that linkage to care system as it operated pre-COVID. Um, we've identified some positive, uh, so some people have tested positive through through this HIV testing program, as well as several others that we've been able to implement. Um, and they've all been able to link to care the way they would have pre-COVID, which is which is amazing. Um, I'll back up just a little bit because I want to spend the majority of my time talking on the like drive up testing that we're doing with INSTI. Um, but it's happening within kind of a larger picture of some of the HIV testing we were able to bring back. Um, so I'll just quickly speed through those other aspects. Uh, there are four hotels in New Orleans that have um, become shelters for the unstably housed and homeless. Um, and we've been able to offer testing as part of the medical screenings in the hotels that they've been doing, um, as well as HCV testing, which has been really um, incredible. Um, I think we've identified uh, like a 3% positivity rate for HIV in the hotels and like a 20, 23% HCV positivity rate um, and linkage is difficult, especially for HCV right now, um, but it's all still in process. Um, we've also begun uh, doing, um, or we've continued to do, as I was saying, we did testing previously as part of uh, routine screenings for people coming in um, for their routine appointments. Um, and we've been able to continue to offer that for those essential labs. Um, we've I think hit about a 1% positivity rate there. And of course, since they're already there for other screenings, they're able to link to care just as, as they had been in the past. Um, for We're implementing, a, or we're using a rapid start program. So basically same day linkage, um, directly uh, observed antiretroviral therapy the day someone tests positive. Um, they're able to talk to a doctor, walk out with a 30 day uh, prescription of medications, um, regardless of ability to pay with a follow-up appointment scheduled for about 30 days out um, for um, uh, once their labs are back in and can be um, assigned a medication that's more specific to, to their needs. Um, so that's kind of how the, the overall linkage looks for the other programs that are happening. Um, when we had to change everything and we started COVID testing, that's kind of where this drive up, drive through uh, situation started happening. Um, so in the garage, in the pictures you'll see later, we have some tents set up and we have providers who are down in the garage doing this COVID screening on a walk-in basis. Um, in general, because a lot of the physicians and providers have been able to do the routine screening for, for us, a lot of them have been certified by the state. They know how to run INSTI. Um, they've been able to do, we, we thought it wasn't a stretch for them to possibly offer INSTI testing as well, right alongside of the COVID screening. Um, now, it's a little bit more difficult than just when we're doing routine screening, because we are seeing people who are like symptomatic, um, who might not be interested in the HIV test, um, who you know are, are really not feeling well. 
and have sought out services because they're not feeling well. And um, while I think there is an overlap uh, in need for offering the HIV testing based on symptoms some in some cases, um, COVID is kind of right now the big, the big like headline and why people are there. Um, so we're doing what we can to normalize testing and have it offered across the board. But we've also seen as um, kind of the increase originally started happening in New Orleans and then COVID tapered off a little bit and we're kind of climbing again now and um, some of the, the restrictions are coming back. Uh, we're seeing more and more people come in for testing and it's kind of uh, an influx on the physicians and limiting their ability to offer testing across the board to everyone who's coming in. Um, so I guess with that, we've done, I was saying we, we've, we're testing out 40 to 50 people a day um, at first, and then we were moving to more about 200 people a day um, most recently, which is just in, insane. Um, we haven't identified anyone who is HIV positive um, in the COVID-19 screenings, um, but we have been able to reach a whole bunch of people who had never tested for HIV previously, which is always part of like HIV testing goals um, to make sure we're like able to offer screenings to everyone and reach people who haven't been screened before. And so using INSTE in this scenario has really helped us reach that community. Um, we also were able to test uh, I think at least five people who knew of a positive uh, exposure and they were looking to kind of close out that window period but because of the reduction of services that are available during COVID, um, they had nowhere to go. And the fact that they were like surprised, able to knock out both their HIV test and their COVID test um, was really helpful for them. Um, like I said, like symptoms for HIV can include symptoms that look very similar to COVID. Um, and so, so for, for the people that were worried about an exposure in a window period, this was um, a really big help as well to be able to offer it as part of that. Um, we are looking currently because, and we didn't actually talk about this yet um, in our pre-conversation, but we're looking at trying to find ways to increase the instant testing that's happening in the garage. Um, since we've kind of hit this new ramp up of people coming in, uh, we want to free up the providers who are doing COVID testing and possibly have someone down there who's able to do only HIV testing in their own space um, so that more people can be seen for INSTE testing um, and help the flow of people who are there for COVID screenings as well. Um, so that's something that we're looking at uh, addressing in the next couple of days. We'll see. Uh, we've already talked to the state um, and agency leadership uh, about that, and it looks like it's going to be able to move forward. Um, for all of this, of course, universal precautions are, are being taken. All of the outside waiting room is like social, socially distant, um, even outside. Everyone is uh, required to wear masks. If you don't come in with one, we have them for you. Um, if you are asymptomatic um, or, or think you're not sick, but you just wanted a test, you're able to sit in a space that's separated from people who are symptomatic uh, and not feeling well. Um, so. Uh, and masking, face shields, wiping down the chairs between clients, all of all of those things are happening. Um, so all of the, we have a full risk mitigation in plan for all of these events that I've been talking about too. So there's a standard operating procedure that we've passed through our chief medical officer, as well as the Office of Public Health to operate all these programs. Um, the last one is we're doing the at-home testing. Uh, so we've been using an oral swab test uh, for people who are coming in or walked in and um, at this point haven't been eligible to get screened for COVID um, and, and therefore tested for HIV as part of that visit, um, we've been able to offer an at-home test kit for them to, to test at home and offer a phone line and someone on staff to kind of talk them through the process on the phone. Um, and we've had at least, I, mean, I think it was two people test positive through that um, out of about a hundred test kits that we've given away so far, um, and both people linked to care same day. That's awesome. Um, and actually, one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Did you have Thanks a question? That was a mouthful. <laughs> no, I was just saying it's impressive. Great job to be able to do all that stuff so so quickly. That's really awesome. Um, and I was just wondering, um, how do you find the uptake of the video or the chat line with the self-testing? 
do you find most people take advantage of it or is it kind of 50 50 um so it works kind of two different ways we've had people who were calling us um and walking in like like normal times um to try and schedule an appointment or find when our walk-in hours were um and in those cases we fill out a form uh, over the phone with them and then just tell them that they can show up to our screening desk in the garage uh, and pick up their HIV test kit there and they give us their name and what time they're coming in and they're able to pick it up really quickly there. Um, if they come into the garage because they thought we were open uh, for like walk-in services as normal, um, we're able to give them a single sheet of paper uh, that they fill out and then we give them the test kit when they, um, when they fill out that form. Um, they're able to call someone if they, and we've had that used. It's it's just a phone line, uh, not a video call. But we've had some people who called this person uh, and just talked through the process of doing the test um, in some cases. And then, as part of the kind of consent of getting the test kit, we've made sure to collect consent that we can follow up within like 48 to 72 hours if we don't hear from them to just check in about the result, see if they need any. Um, you know, uh, resources, whether it's PrEP at that point, condoms, uh, linkage to care if it did come back as reactive, um, and, and that kind of thing. So it's been, it's been handy to have a, a phone line system, which has also been great because we've had so many people working from home and the need to like transition some job duties to fill, you know, people's uh, hours for work. Um, and so having this person on hand um, just kind of really fit into that picture. Um, and through the, the at-home testing, I think, is, was actually started first. And because of that, we realized that we were having people still coming in for HIV testing. And that's what led us to doing the INSTE testing in the garage. Awesome. And we'll be looking forward to hearing about how things go with the, mo with the unit testing as well, once you're able to do. Uh, yeah, I'm super excited. <laughs> like that. Um, so Regina, is there anything you'd like to add from the things that you've heard and out there? Yeah, with um, just, um, on the topic of at-home testing, we've had a lot of organizations reach out to us about our one-minute test. Have you guys had an increase in inquiries um, about a one-minute at-home test? I know, Joey, you guys are already offering uh, probably another brand. Um, I, is it or quick? For at-home testing, yes. Um, I'm just curious to know if um, if there has been any a preference for a one-minute test instead. Um, I within the circles that I know, uh, within like the world of HIV prevention, yes, um, because people have heard the rumors of that happening um, on the street. Uh, it hasn't come from like the the clients just yet, um, but I think that in most cases. People want their results faster in the 20 minutes mm -hmm. while or, or however long um, provides opportunity for conversation or anything. I think that people uh, are looking for faster results um, and it helps reduce stress and wait time um, and linkage to care time when we're in, in the position to be able to link people to care as fast as we are. Great. Yeah, I'll have to agree with Joey. In, in our circles, it's definitely like, where's this minute at home test? Where's this minute at home test? Um, and it's it's a, a great thing for folks who are LGBTQ and in rural places where they don't have access to a community center, where they can just get the ship to them, where they can just get, pick it up themselves, and they don't have to worry about any confidentiality issues. But I, I will say that we do get some people who use the at home tests right now. And we'll use it as their like their first test and then they'll come back to us and be like oh i just want to do a follow-up test to make sure that this is legit and ask some mm -hmm. questions so it's it's definitely a mixed bag but um folks are always asking for something that's easier more convenient more confidential so at home tests would be yeah, a yeah, great yeah. asset and for everybody at home wondering um the answer is yes we are working on one so um, that's something to look forward to <laughs> as we evolve and adjust to the pandemic and, you know, everything's changing. So we have something to look forward to. That's awesome. Looking forward to that. Okay. Um, so this is kind of another following up question about the drive up, drive through uh, testing. Um, I just, I guess we've really covered it in depth. So maybe just 
any quick tips that you would have uh, for organizations that are maybe starting up? Um, I was thinking about do's and don'ts. Um, anything that surprised you maybe that you didn't expect? Um, maybe we'll start with Ishmael. Yeah. Um, so I know in the last community chat, people were talking about scrubs and how that worked. Typically testers don't have to wear scrubs because you're not doing too much, but right now, like post COVID or during COVID, scrubs tend to be very, very helpful. And we're also limiting scrub tra like travel. So you just have your scrubs for home for the uh, office and you don't take those home. Sometimes people just go home with their scrubs and have no deal. So it's developed this whole process of scrubs for the office, not for home. So that has definitely added to something. So I would say that's a, a huge do. Um, we're noticing something very odd with getting tested outside. So California, 70, 75, 80 degree weather, and it's starting to get a little bit warmer. We're noticing a lot of extra blood, if you want to put it that way, when the sample gets collected. We had a couple squirters, we had a couple situations where just like, oh, this has never happened before, but we're noticing that's happening. So we're thinking that because of the weather, if people are standing up or walking to the, to the window or whatever is happening, we're noticing definitely more blood present when we're doing testing, especially in the, the, the fish tank that I'm calling. Uh, we noticed that a couple times already. So we're definitely using goggles or face shields plus the face mask and everything is, is kind of put away. So if there is anything squirting, it just stays in a very um, sanitized and kind of safe space. So um, we're noticing that as something that is a, I'm not sure if it's a do or a don't, it's kind of in those like, oh, just heads up. We're noticing more of this happening. Um, and then confidentiality is another thing. Um, I'm not sure if this happens to you, Joey, in your space where people could just be walking by doing something else. And if they notice someone is either in line or waiting or coming out of that, they'll be asked, like, what do you, what do you, um, what's, what's going on? What are you there for? Um, we've had some clients that have felt uncomfortable having to tell folks, oh, I'm doing an HIV test. And we've had others who are more advocates for themselves. And if said, oh, there's an HIV test, you should go sign up. So that's something that we're still trying to figure out how to change to create it to create a space that's more confidential because being outside you don't really have control of who is, is watching or who's looking or walking by so we've definitely learned that as, as something that we want to kind of update uh, and the other is that people just like joey's doing the connection with COVID testing and hiv testing folks are asking about other STIs. They want to like, when are you bringing back the STI testing? When am I going to be able to get my uh, throat and rectal swab? So that's been on our on our to-do list. So if there's any rapid syphilis test, I think that's the thing that's holding us back a little bit because we still have to draw a full tube for uh, syphilis testing. So that's one of the things that we're trying to incorporate. But what we are doing is linking folks to local providers that we've recommended that are LGBTQ affirming because being able to get the full panel that most of our community members need has been difficult. Most people are just collecting one particular sample. So what we are doing is linking with other places that are able to do STI testing, which are most likely FQHDs or, or clinics that are devoted to that section of, of sexual health. So that's been a good do to have that, that linkage to, to other services that are needed, but um, that's next on my list. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And um, something I've heard as well is about um, people just generally being more aware of their health and more willing mm -hmm. to ask for other kinds of tests as well, like the demand in uh, syphilis, requesting syphilis tests and things like that. It's something I've heard as well. And I think maybe we mentioned on the last webinar too. So, Yeah, even before this, we've had like a huge spike in STIs, especially now that people who do this for, for a living um, are screening other places like throat and rectal uh, samples. We're seeing like a huge spike here in Long Beach specifically with, um, with syphilis and chlamydia. So now folks that know this are definitely coming in to get tested where they realize that their doctor is just collecting a urine sample and they're like, oh no, this place knows better. So let me, let me go there. That's where the questions for more and more and more started happening with us. It's interesting. Um, and there was one yeah. other point I just remember you mentioning previously on the phone. Um, about some of your clients finding their drive up um, actually it, like feeling very safe in the space with the drive up <laughs> testing. So yeah, in the teleconferences, for some reason, being in your own car might be kind of being in your own home where you're able to just have a much more comfortable 
open conversation than they would normally in our exam rooms. Um, we try to make them as homey as possible. Uh, most of the furniture in there is from Ikea. And, like the kitchen stuff looks like a nice little home kitchen area. So it looks very homey and people have been able to talk a little bit more. But lately when we do the teleconferencing, people are very comfortable just not even ask uh, answering questions, but just telling me straight off the bat what they're willing to do. And my team is also letting me know that it's much easier to do the, the telehealth conferencing in the person's car. They just feel a little bit more comfortable to, to share that information. So that's been a, a, another plus to be able to have the, the ability to do the telehealth in the car for folks to be there to share that information. So thanks for reminding me. No, that's awesome. I was, my heart was very warmed when I was hearing that over the phone previously. So I definitely wanted to make sure other people could hear it too. Yeah, and the stuff that they share is also very interesting because it's like I mentioned with Regina, we get so many people who their needs are kind of intersectional where they'll come in and they're able to get out of the house to say that they're going to go do an HIV test or an STI test. And in those conferences or conversations, they'll tell me something about their relationship problems or they'll tell me that they're interested in PrEP, but they don't want to tell their, their partner about it. So they, they definitely are able to not just talk about sexual health things, they're able to sit in their car away from wherever they are. Because sometimes we have folks who still live at home who may not feel comfortable doing that conversation at their home. So it's it's been eye opening and, and heartwarming, like you like you said, Lauren, but it's also eye opening to the the amount of crisis that people are experiencing right now with COVID. So domestic violence is a huge issue right now. Um, most, if not everybody who works here is getting those calls of now you're stuck at home with your partner. So how do you talk about things? So in, in line of what we're talking about now, how do you talk about reducing your risk if your partner doesn't want to wear a condom or um, you're having sex without consent? So it's, it's kind of an interesting conversation to be able to have. So um, we're fortunate right now that everyone has the technology to, to do it. So um, Ish and Joey, um, my, my next question may or may not require a little bit of critical thinking, but as you know, each organization is set up differently for their HIV prevention services. A lot of these organizations have uh, very limited resources and some may not have a parking lot, some may not have the ability to set up a tent for walk-up testing. What um, advice do you have for them? Um, I know you mentioned a little bit linking up with another organization, maybe linking up with the FQHC that might have a parking lot that they could use. Um, do you have any other advice for these organizations that want to be able to offer HIV testing to their clients, but um, confidentiality is an issue? Um, what sort of advice do you have? Yeah, um, I would start with the fact that people are definitely still seeking services and are pretty, at least in our case, have been willing to be flexible with us. Everyone understands that like we are in unprecedented times um, and people still want services. Um, so if you have clients, if you have people coming in pre-COVID that were interested in testing, you still have those people in your community um, and they are probably going to work with you. Um, if you're able to gesture towards respecting their, their privacy and, and taking steps to ensure um, you know, that respect. Um, I think also partnering is a huge key if you don't have access to something. Um, some of our at-home test kit giveaway situations have happened in partnership with other agencies who have put together like um, one of the bars in the French Quarter had a health fair that was for a COVID screening, um, some plan B access and a couple other things. And we were able to partner with them and they had a tent and we were able to give out our at-home test kits there. Um, so it's possible that if you don't have the space or resources available at your location, that there are probably other agencies bars, <laughs> other people that are partnering and pulling together community resources that you'd be able to to um, partner with and be able to reach your community still. That's great. I think that that's awesome. That's a brilliant idea. I've never thought about bars uh, for testing here in Long Beach, but doing what we do for a living, we're, uh, we're, we're grassroots. Like when I started working here, just how do you duplicate documents if we don't have a functioning copier. Like, it's just like how you had to think outside the box all the time. Um, what I would say is just 
try looking at, if you're an organization who doesn't have the space or the resources, try looking at it as like, what do you want to do? What is it about your space that makes you think you have to do it there and, and kind of build from there? So before we thought about the pop-up tent, we um, have two entrances at the front and the back of the building. The back is a little bit more confidential. There's an alleyway back there where you don't necessarily have main traffic. So we started thinking about just putting up a tarp at that door where you kind of think, okay, walk up to the door and you can do testing at that door where you don't necessarily need that space. So that was initially what started the conversation. And what Joey was talking about, about using other, like partnering for National HIV Testing Day, we used to partner with Walgreens back in the day here in, in Long Beach. And we don't have a mobile testing unit, but they really wanted the LGBT center there. So we were able to convert their break room into our testing spot. So we actually went in there, not renovated it, but just kind of super cleaned it and just created a space that was tested, uh, testing appropriate. And you just communicate with whoever has your CLIA license, which makes your test waivable in that spot. And you provide that address, they check out the space. That takes some time, obviously, but if you're able to do that, then you can get that waiver and test wherever you need to. So we were able to do that a couple of years back where we realized that Walgreens was getting a lot of foot traffic with the folks that we really wanted to reach to a reach, but then they don't have a testing facility. We don't have a mobile. So we were like, well, let's convert this space into something that works. Um, so thinking about what first your goal is, like, what do you want to do? Um, and I'm really going to steal that idea from Joey now because we have a whole line of bars that are available. And there is one that comes to mind that has a huge parking lot. Um, and just finding a way to be able to, to do that um, now sparked ideas. So I feel like these conversations probably also need to be something that happens on a more regular basis in each city where you're sitting on these brilliant ideas and you have no idea that they're brilliant for other people. Because, um, yeah, I'm already thinking about working with mobile units that aren't being used at the moment. So we do have a lot of organizations that don't have access to a mobile are already clear waived. If I can get one of those parked at this bar parking lot, I can staff it with my team and we can do testing that. So thank you, Joey. You just inspired something else to, to do out here. <laughs> It's Thank great you. I'm actually excited to talk uh, more with my team about this, like drive up and sticking your hand out the window, teapot or princess, because uh, yeah. that might be something that we can actually implement and help us um, as we see more clients for COVID that the providers aren't able to do the HIV testing. I'm pretty sure there's an emoji for this as well. <laughs> <laughs> you can put that on your end. One of my faves. <laughs> Oh, well, this is so great. I mean, this is the spirit of the, the whole conversation and the webinars is sparking ideas and having a conversation. So, mm -hmm. yeah, really happy. Um, before I just switch on to the next slide, was there anything else, Joey, uh, do's and don'ts wise about the drive up concept? I don't think I have any like hard and fast do's or don'ts because it's all pretty flexible and it'll have to be adapted to what your capabilities are. Um, just that there's probably a way to make it happen. Um, I'm happy to share the SOPs that I've like written up and drafted for each of the programs that I've done. So if anyone on the on the call today does have a question or wants to look over SOPs like in depth, I'm happy to share those things um, for more of like a do or don't that you can translate to your program specifically. That's wonderful. Thank you yeah. so much. Same here. Like just an, another set of eyes to be able to edit what ideas you have. Just call, email, and because I didn't get where I'm at without getting feedback from other people. So I feel like we should be able to do that for sure. That's so awesome. And actually already preempted one of the things that came up in the last webinar where people were asking for kind of like real documentation, uh, like that they could, I guess, use as an inspiration to start them off. So. Yeah. I know just already. Like COVID, but... Yeah, just like we don't know anything about COVID, we don't know anything about how to write a protocol for drive up testing in a parking lot or a, yeah, it's never been done before. So yeah, don't don't feel like you have to come up with it on your own. Awesome, that's great advice. Okay. Oh, um, so this is just a quick question about whether you are promoting or how do you promote uh, the drive up testing. Um, maybe Joey, do you have any current uh, initiatives to promote? Uh, great question. So we don't actually promote it at this point. Um, we promote the, the COVID testing, um, but not the HIV testing as part of the, the drive up. It's 
at this point only been people who are already seeking out healthcare services um, and happened to find out that HIV testing was available. Um, and we kept it that way for a little while because we weren't sure about the capacity we had and the volume of, you know, people who are, um, who would be reached by that message and then come flooding in and like overwhelm our capacity. Um, however, now that we're, we have several months of like best practices and a handle on the workflow, uh, actually one of the conversations this, today's Friday? Today, I don't know what today is anymore. <laughs> <laughs> at some point this week um our conversation was about how do we start promoting um uh, promoting this testing so that's probably one of the next steps that we're doing um looking at some of the the local media sources and outlets that we've previously used for our healthcare outreach um so coming coming to a billboard near you <laughs> Nice, yeah, and that's it's definitely been an interesting topic about how how to promote these new forms of testing. Um, Ishmael, do you have any anything to add? Yeah, similar to to Joey, we wanted to take it easy because I know that the second we put something out there, they're all everyone's gonna run over, and we're still kind of figuring this out. So now that we have it figured out, I think once this airs and it's out there, we should have things a little bit more generalized, so we'll be able to get information out there. Most of the stuff that we're doing is sending out emails or mailers to folks that are already in our system. So people who've accessed our services before, that's how we're promoting. And also social media. We've been using uh, Instagram and Facebook to just post out some, some images of folks. Because right there, we're focusing on the people who are following us. Uh, and typically, those are our clients that, that are seeing us. But once this airs, we'll be able to probably go a little bit longer with uh, promotion and kind of pushing out farther. So things like Scruff and Grindr, uh, are usually like our go-tos to to promote on um, dating apps. Um, we we don't have the billboard money, but we'll just put some posters and, and take them everywhere and kind of do the the old school grassroots uh, and just take those out there. But uh, yeah, in about a, 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 a week, we should be able to be out there when we now are going to moving to uh, Monday through Friday testing. That's awesome, um, and I know that your social media is reaching out there because. That's how I found out about your drive-through testing program when I saw an awesome video uh, a few weeks ago um, about it. So, yeah. In my uh, PowerPoint animation skills, because uh, I'm bored at home working remotely, I was like, let's see what I can do with PowerPoint. And I made a really cool video that I had no idea you can do. So now people most likely have PowerPoint in their computers. So um, yeah, yeah, you can do your own little graphic videos. Yeah, awesome. I do have one quick thing to add there. I actually thought of one of the, the only thing that we had done to promote some of our testing uh, was to print out some flyers um, that we were able to give to one of the food banks that kind of popped up during COVID. Um, it's actually running out, if anyone's been to New Orleans, Oz on Bourbon Street, it's a gay bar. Um, they're running a food pantry right now. Um, so we were able to give flyers to them to give out as part of their meal delivery and food delivery process to let um, clients that we know were at increased need of testing services um, know that they were available. Um, so that was one, one thing that we were able to do and just send out a certain amount of flyers that we knew we had the capacity to handle. Yeah, so important so to connect with your communities right now. Yeah, and it's so nice to hear how like everyone's collaborating, you know, even bars stepping in for food banks or supporting testing. It's so good. Okay, so my next couple of questions are more about the future. So I actually have, is this testing format here to stay and what's coming up next? But I think we can probably combo them whether you're going to keep up the drive through and your other programs um, and if there's anything you have planned for the future. Um, do you want to start us off, Joey? Yeah. Um, I hope HIV testing as part of COVID testing is not here to stay. <laughs> uh, so I hope we maximize the impact of that um, and are able to offer services there while it's while it's here and it's a thing and that we're able to reach people who maybe weren't, um, didn't have HIV testing on their radar as a way to like, you know, reach those reach those people um the other aspects of it though i think probably are here to stay at home testing um has been something we've been interested in for a very long time and how to do partner testing or if someone 
does test positive during a walk-in test, how do you then make sure they're able to communicate with their partners if they feel comfortable to do that um, around testing and, and sending a test kit home with them? Um, those kind of things, I think testing as a drive up option is just genius. That was not something that was on, I don't think anyone's radar uh, pre-COVID. And I think that it does offer uh, a really unique way to, like how, how would a health fair look with drive up testing? If you don't have a mobile unit, but you are able to do something like that based on having a parking spot and maybe a brick and mortar location like a Walgreens or something that maybe doesn't have a lab space, but you have a, an office space where you could go and run the test and, and do it like that. Like there, there are so many, I think, new and innovative ideas that are going to come out of where we are now um, that we weren't even thinking of prior to this. That's great. Yeah, and definitely wanna, yeah just want to echo what he said. I, I don't want the, the crazy reactionary panic testing that we're doing right now. We're just like everyone is, is scared and concerned, rightfully so. Um, but I do feel like we've learned a lot in terms of technology and how we can use that. Like I feel like doing the telehealth that we've been kind of forced to move towards is something that we never really thought that we could do. So I'm thinking like pre-test counseling, post-test follow-up, like that could be something that now is accessible that we never really thought was accessible. Um, the reason I say that is before, I think there was more like the HIPAA concerns, the confidentiality concerns on the other end, but seeing these companies that do have access to telecommunication um, are up, are ramping up that. So I think that's also something that's changed post COVID where people are realizing that this is a technology we can use, but we need to protect people's information. So I see that sticking. Um, and then we've also moved to digital forms. So everything is just now on your phone or we have tablets now that people can use if they don't have that. So I feel like that's going to remove the whole need for pen and paper uh, potentially uh, moving forward. So not only is it going to be a cost saver, but we're going to really reduce any kind of chance of exposing people to anything else. Like we're talking about like the common cold or um, the flu. I mean, it's just really something that is, is kind of awesome right now. Um, one thing that I do wish says is this collaboration. Like I just want this to not end. I feel like we always as health organizations and nonprofits, we're like, but just like circle each other around and like, okay, how do we help each other out in response to a crisis? Um, which I also want to keep, but I also want to do this more on a regular basis. Like, hey, it's Tuesday. How do we figure this out? Um, that's something that I want to keep because it's been very, very helpful. I, I don't feel as isolated as a provider that's thinking, okay, how do I help my community? Now it's become, how do we help our community? So it's been that part I really do like. That's amazing. Um, and Regina, any thoughts about what's up next uh, among other customers or what you've heard out there? Um, I just think that the drive up testing is definitely going to be here to stay. Um, you know, increased usage of telehealth, you know, would be really great. Um, and definitely that at home testing. Those are just the few things that I think that is the future. Yeah, that's great. Okay, um, so now we're down to our Q&A. Um, I will try and make this quick because I think we're probably coming up for an hour. Um, and thank you all so much for everything you've added. Um, so one of the questions that we had last time was about the resulting out positives with drive through uh, or curbside testing, which I think we might have already covered a little bit. But um, if you have any other points to add, um, please feel free. I was like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> sorry. Um, so we've, uh, we, our positivity rate is has always ebbs and flows, but we have about like between a two and a three percent positivity rate for the number of tests that we do here. Um, it's dropped since we started doing uh, STI testing, but that's only because we're seeing more people who aren't necessarily at risk for HIV. Um, but one of the things that we've implemented even before COVID is just being able to have that very frank possibly blunt conversation of how do we handle today if you were to test HIV positive? And that's something that we've done since I started testing here in 2009, 10, where just we walk through that possibility so that way folks know, okay, this is what my plan is. And the tester knows, okay, this person either has or does not have a plan. And how do we prepare for that? Um, during COVID, what we're doing right now is like 
figuring out what that would look like. Because now you have a person in their car who now has to drive home knowing this information, or they can just drive off. Normally, you would have them in the waiting room or in the exam room where you can kind of keep them away from their vehicle a little easier. So just trying to think ahead, like, how do we prepare for this person? So just being able to be straightforward with how do we handle this if it were to happen next. Typically, people will tell us, well, I can call Regina, my best friend. She'll be able to answer these questions for me or she's there for me. She knows that I'm here. So being able to have that conversation with folks so they realize, okay, it's not just me in my car by myself. Um, same thing with the testers. It helps them realize, okay, we covered our bases where I know that if I was about to say a, a, a bad word, if, if things hit the fan, um, we know what we need to do and what we don't have access to. So I feel like that's the reality that sometimes we try to avoid as testers. We try to make sure like everything's happy go lucky. We're not going to talk about that, that negative conversation. So um, yeah, I, that would be something that I would approach testing with um, moving forward. Yeah, I think they, um, we are, are fortunate to be running a rapid start linkage program, which even under COVID is allowing people to link to care like same day. And so they're able to have that conversation with the physician. They're able to get their medication that same day and feel like empowered by that same day. Um, but I think regardless of what linkage program that you're operating under, uh, Ish, you are absolutely correct. Managing those expectations um, from the beginning is always going to be key and like before you even start the test talking about the possible results and what it would look like for you to link to care and what it would look like you know in 20 minutes from now regardless of the results here's here are the next steps um yeah so totally agree with you there that's great um regina anything to add or any other questions from the q a um, I, I guess one of the only things that I was thinking about was um, the co-testing of COVID and HIV right now. So how do you handle that linkage to care in the event that you have a COVID positive and an HIV positive? What does that look like? Uh, so right now, the COVID tests, um, the rapid tests for COVID are come and go so quickly that generally it's like the nasopharyngeal uh, swab that happens, which at best case scenario is like a two day waiting uh, period to get the results. And in some cases like seven to 10 days in like worst case scenario. So you generally aren't having to deliver the COVID positive results and linkage at that point. Um, so having an HIV test come back as reactive um, wouldn't necessarily change anything based on that. They've, they've only just tested for COVID, no mm -hmm. results, no action other than continuing to like be socially distant, mask up, um, isolate at home if you need to, like, like that kind of protocol until those results come in. Um, but otherwise, <clears throat> if they are there for COVID and they are symptomatic, um, the doctors are still able to talk to them. There is the outdoor space, there is a lab in space um, that they are able to use and have labs drawn. Um, so basically, <laughs> we're able to, we are able to make it happen uh, either way, um, and then the COVID result would come a couple of days later. Yeah, on our end, we're not doing COVID testing, but we do see folks who see our fish tank and think that we are doing COVID testing. So there's a lot of these questions of, um, are you testing? Can I get tested? Where do I get tested? So being able to have my team prepared to answer some of those COVID-related questions and linking folks to uh, a testing site is, is pretty crucial for what we're doing. Um, we also get folks who are confusing, or not confusing, but are more worried about the symptoms that they're getting from potentially COVID, thinking that it's HIV. So we start mm -hmm. seeing people thinking, oh my God, I have HIV, I have HIV, when um, they should be considering COVID. We, we just had someone yesterday come into testing who had COVID symptoms. So we had to like, just redirect the conversation and be like, let's not talk about sex at the moment. Let's get you connected to a COVID test. And luckily we were able to get them to where they needed to get to. Um, but that's the part that people may not put two and two together where they think, okay, well, I have flu-like symptoms. This must be HIV because this is what we think of uh, specifically in the LGBTQ community where that's the first thought we go to, no matter what you're doing or not doing. So being able to redirect that conversation and it's not an easy transition. It's more, okay, now we have to worry about something else. Um, but having that resource is, I think, important for us. To to places. OK, 
Okay, um, so our, our last couple of slides are just some photos from the two programs, which I'm super excited to share. It's really nice to be able to have these. Um, so Ish, do you want to explain anything on these images? Um, I know we're looking at the fish tank, so. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, the first picture on the left is, is the view from inside the fish tank where you can kind of see the, the waiting uh, pop-up tent that's on the other side and that's mostly for folks that are walking up to get tested. So they're able to have like a shaded area where they're socially distant from each other and they can kind of not be an earshot. But you can see how there's a parked car right there and that's the sidewalk. We have a couple of restaurants in the area. So it becomes very important to keep that interaction quick. So that way there is no um, loss of confidentiality. Um, and then the picture next to that is just what we're using in terms of the database that I mentioned. So that person is holding up their uh, screener form. So they're able to kind of do their screener straight from their car. Um, it's very easy and straightforward. And from there, that's where we go do the test. Um, and then it, that's the little cutout on the last picture on the right where it's very straightforward. There's no potential for droplets or anything to get past there. It's a, it's a really nice thick uh, wall that comes with the pop-up tent that we purchased like you just go straight straight to the person that get, got you the pop-up and you ask for windows um or for um clear plastic walls and you're able to get that and it's a little bit complicated to put back up and down every testing day um but we got it down to about uh, 15 minutes before it used to take us about 45 minutes to put that together every time um but now we're moving towards taking this this is the front of the center we're going to take it to the back and just create its own little outdoor space. Because um, one of the things I didn't mention in the what's next is that we're gonna try to do walk-up STI testing where people come pick up their samples to swab and everything at home, um, create this little outdoor space, if you wanna call it that, for, for testing. So that, that'll be next. But that's, yeah, that's the fish tank. That's where my staff kind of float around and do, do testing. That's awesome. Um, and the artwork on the front of your center is so beautiful as well. That's so nice. Yeah, that was a mural that happened after the uh, Pulse incident that happened. We had a local artist that wanted to do something um, in honor of them. You can't see the dedication, which is on the right of the mural, but yeah, that was up a, a few years back. Um, it's kind of cool. Great. I like it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, and just down to, oh, <laughs> Gone ahead of myself. Um, here's Joey's images. Joey, I hope I managed to capture as many as possible to fit on there. Um, would you like to take us through them? Yeah. Uh, so there on the kind of far right, uh, you can see the tents, um, and we're posing with some PPE that was back right at the beginning when there was like no PPE to be found, and we got a donation. So that was our thank you photo uh, for the donation of that PPE. Um, but those are the tents um, that we're currently using for COVID screening. Um, that was also like mid-March when the weather was like a little bit nicer. So they were out in the sun. It's too hot for that in Louisiana now. So those are under the garage <laughs> uh, in the shade. And we actually have um, some AC units, which you can see on that bottom photo. Uh, that's what it looks like inside one of those tents. There's the table uh, for testing supplies, a fan. That machine on the right is like a little mobile AC unit um, so it can keep things cooler inside the tent. Um, the photo that has kind of those cones in the background, um, that is uh, what has become the like waiting room, um, the shaded waiting room. Now we have chairs there six feet apart um, and the medical mobile unit is still there. That's the kind of center photo. Um, and that's where that's still located um, and possibly could be doing in HIV testing coming up. Excellent, that's amazing. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining our community conversation. Uh, do you, any of you have any closing remarks before we finish up? Just thank you guys both for joining us and sharing all your, the knowledge that you guys have right now. I'm sure it's gonna be very helpful for everybody who's tuning in and thinking about setting up their own drive-through testing. Yeah, same thing. Thank you for this opportunity to be able to talk and sharing the previous conversation. I got some inspiration from there too. And I think moving forward, if we keep doing more of this, or if you wanna reach out to me, I mean, I'm not gonna speak for Joey, but I feel like Joey said that reach out to us um, and just ask questions, get ideas out. If you found a flaw in what I'm doing, give me a call. I, I'd love to hear that information, but I feel like this is 
very important right now and moving forward, no matter whether we're in crisis mode or, or not. Um, I think these conversations are important. So if you're feeling stuck wherever you're watching this, uh, reach out. I think there's no shame in saying, hey, I have this idea or I really like your idea. How do I update it for my space? I think just reach out. Yeah. Uh, also, just thank you for having me. Um, this was a pleasure to be a part of. Um, I uh, am really grateful for the opportunity. Um, I would also say, yes, contact me if you have questions about the programs or want to look at the SOP for sure. Um, but I don't think that I'm special for being here, if that makes sense. I think that if you have been watching this and you see something in our programs and you're like, oh, this is a way that this can be better because we're doing it and this might be helpful for you, I am also open uh, for some feedback and help because we're all just trying to get services to our communities and to our clients. Um, and I really appreciate this kind of space to be able to talk through these, these um, solutions. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Let's definitely keep the conversation going. Mm -hmm. And definitely going to be looking forward to Regina's update on the at-home in C test. So mm -hmm. I will be stalking you, Regina. <laughs> I'm crossing my fingers for next year. Hopefully, you know how it's a process with the FDA. Yeah. So we're we're on the path. Good to hear. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, yep. Thank you all for all of your insights. Um, once again, I just feel so incredibly lucky to have spent uh, time with all three of you and hearing all your insights and everything you've talked about. Um, just once again, just really blown away and really happy to be part of this conversation. Um, so if anyone missed anything in this webinar or wants to share it with others, um, we will be following up with an email um, and it will also be posted to our YouTube channel. Um, we're also going to be following up this webinar with an email, so we'd love to hear what you think and any suggestions for any future topics. Um, in the meantime, thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening in. Um, and we're looking forward to our next community conversation. Thank okay, you. Bye. bye. Okay, you guys, I've stopped recording.